lecture, we're already up to lecture 13 of CS10. The title is Applications That Have Changed the World. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the cool things about this course is we get to actually have some context. It's not just about programming. The course this is replacing is an all programming course. But we decided we want to have a lot more perspective on that. And so this is one of those great lectures where I get to share all the things that you take for granted. And I'll give you some historical context and also kind of where these things might go. So today's going to be a fun, really fun. It's going to be a, what we call a breadth lecture, where I go over a lot of things, but in very little depth. Just a very breadth kind of talk, making sure I at least touch on all these wonderful things that have contributed to, your, uh, to where we are now in terms of productivity, in terms of computing. I always try to include a technology in the news. And I saw this on technologyreview.com, one of the MIT's technology magazines, that the Army is working on flexible displays. And there's two problems with flexible displays. One is power, and one is you want to be able to you know, get bonked around when you hit a tree and not break. You know, you can't, normal displays, even iPods, all that stuff will, will break if you hit a tree. Um, they want to try to have one that doesn't do that. So they did that. They actually have an OLED, which is kind of an organic light emitting diode display that's flexible. You wear it on your wrist. You wear it on kind of, as it's displayed in this picture. Um, you can imagine the uses for it, viewing maps or some kind of thing, or even talking to, like Dick Tracy. You know, Dick Tracy was this comic strip back in my day where you would talk to your, talk to your person on the thing. So you'd have teleconferencing, movies, movies. Yeah, movies. That's nice, Dan. Watching Avatar when you're fighting. Yeah, no. So maps, videos, anything that's relevant, um, and uh, flexible and uh, not breakable which is awesome. Oh, the other part is cool. Um, doesn't drain the batteries. So very much like the Kindle, you guys know how the Kindle works? It has these little teeny circles that are colored and they spin. And then it's very low power. It's re remarkably low power. It's like a, it's this really amazing uh, invention. You should read about how that works. But they're working one kind of thing like that. So you basically set the color and then the power doesn't have to be sent to Kindle. By the way, this, here's my iPhone. There's a picture. Almost all the power that's being used right now is to drive the display. The display is very high cost in terms of battery usage. So that's a concern here. And so you have something that's very low power in terms of the display itself. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's get rolling. So there, it's really hard to divide the world, divide all the things that have been invented into what are the things that have changed the world versus all the inventions, period. So I tried to focus on only those that are related to computing. Anything that's kind of in the flavor of computing rather than Refrigeration, by the way, is one of the things they mention as in terms of all the inventions of the 20th century that changed the world. Without refrigeration, you can't have people living in cities, right? You have to live in farms because the food has to be near where you live. You can't have people to have the density of population in cities without refrigeration. You can't get you know, meat from far away without refrigeration. Uh, you had ice boxes, but you couldn't do that. So that was one of the big inventions that changed the world. But for this lecture, I'm talking about computing in particular. Okay? Uh, I'll talk about some key players. Um, I'll talk about the shoulders. You know, you stand on the shoulders of giants. I'll talk about kind of who built what, which then contributed to this person building that, contributed to this person building that. For, every, for, for many of the applications I'll talk about today, and how in particular it changed the world. So you'll see, you'll be used to all these things, but you might not know the historical stuff. So this is probably, a, 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 the new information you probably get is some of the historical things. So, blink. So many applications have changed the world, as you know. Um, this is a focus on the computing ones. And it's also really easy to focus on the recent end years. Like, you know, in your lifetime, that's what you know. So it's really easy to say, well, Facebook has changed the world in a way that nothing else has. It's true in some context, but it ignores 60 years of inventions that led up to Facebook, right? You have to have a lot of things, the internet as an example, or the transistor, the computer. So we'll talk about that, some obvious ones as well. Clickers, here we go. When did the first computer debut and action? OK, 46. And that's what you say. Wow, look, for, look at you guys. Well done. So I'm going to stop this and look at that. Well done. And the answer is B. Good job. Half of you get it right. That's because the answer is on the next slide. <coughs> yes, this is, you're not supposed to look at that when you do that. So the early inventions was the 1940s. Uh, I won't make it so obvious for the next question, click a question. Um, there are several inventions that came through all about the same time. It was a really exciting time to be kind of in the forefront of uh, math departments and engineering departments uh, and inventors. If you were in the inventor space, this is really exciting. About, you know, I see a couple of different computers in different places all happening around the 40s. It's really exciting. Um, a really important name that you know is Claude Shannon. 
Claude Shannon here, the Shannon's Theories of Computing and Communication. It's really important that you know about a name Claude Shannon. He has some seminal papers on the, how, how, how just even bits work and how if you have a noisy channel, what can you guarantee and what can't you guarantee in terms of being able to communicate some bits from here to, to get received and interpret it at the other side with noise, inter you know, messing with some of that. Uh, Alan Turing obviously had his theory of computability around, these t around that time. Uh, AI was starting to kind of come up. It was really exciting. There is an entire museum dedicated to the computer, an entire museum called the Computer History Museum. And this is in Mountain View. I encourage all of you to go if you can. Um, lots of incremental progress, lots of little incremental progress in the early days. Again, the early computers were the size of a house, really. It was incredible how costly how big, how much power they took, and how often they broke. Because they were pre predominantly, the early computers were all made with vacuum tubes, like televisions were. And vacuum tubes would break on an order of, so you, on big computers, you were replacing more than one an hour, which is just amazing that you don't have a computer that's going to work for more than that before. Something breaks, and some, some bit is problem in the, and how, determining. For me, I don't even know how they would determine when a vacuum tube would go off, would, would break whether they're scanning it constantly or what, but that was a real early problem. Um, and everything, er, everything that we have now owes its success to that. That's one of the, the early giants of that. The transistor comes after the computer. And you say, well, isn't that, that's weird, right? That's impossible. Well, the transistor, they say, this is the picture of it, was born on that day, 1947, December 23rd. A semiconductor is a device that, the word semi means, sometimes conducts electricity and sometimes doesn't. And has the wonderful property that it can be used as a switch, as a binary switch, and you can make logical gates out of them, like an AND and an OR and a NOT gate. It can also be used in an analog domain to amplify signals. So I can have a very small signal, say from a microphone, and then pass it through circuitry, primarily based on a transistor and an amplifier, and have it come out of big, huge speakers as like you see here in the room. And that's all using the analog domain of the chip of a transistor. The digital domain is how computers and graphics cards and all the things that are in a computer work. It's pretty cool. Who has been the successful, who were one of the first people credited for the invention of that? The name is Bardeen, Shockley, and Bertin. Uh, and Lucent, or Bell Labs, was the place that happened. And before that, I mentioned vacuum tubes were there. After that, once you have this, by the way, it's, it's huge. This first thing is this big. And microprocessors are now so much smaller that you can fit you know, on uh, a current die, we talked about what a die is, on a current CPU die, you can fit now in the almost, is it almost trillions, billions to trillions of processors. So the, the size of actually is unbelievable. Right? We talked about the feature size, you can actually work it out. The feature size is down to 22 nanometers, how many you could fit on a, a square inch. Um, so integrated circuits and microprocessors was the key. And here's a great quote from Ira Flato. He does Science Friday in the Bay Area. Um, the transistor was probably the most important invention of the 20th century. Some other, other folks argue that refrigeration, as I mentioned before, but the transistor made everything possible in terms of electronics. So that's pretty exciting. The internet. I'm trying to do kind of chronologically where things happen, but no, I won't always follow that rule. In 62, so this is a kind of cool thing. If we didn't have the internet, then you'd have no way to talk to anything else. So JCR Licklider, who is the head of ARPA. You may know what ARPA stands for? In slides, you're always supposed to say the word and then have the have the acronym for it afterwards. Have you heard of ARPA, DARPA? Have you heard of DARPA before? Go ahead, Robert. Roberto. Defense Network. Yes, yeah, yeah. Advanced Research Project Agency, I think, is that right? And I was on a slide, so yeah. Uh, D for defense, OK? Um, so he had this vision. He, had the, he was in charge of a lot of money, right? When you're in charge of DARPA or ARPA back then, you have a lot of money. You can fund basic research. And so one of the things he funded was, this idea that some folks said, you know, we have an idea for trying to build this system. And he said, let's make it happen. Let's actually, let me fund it. Let me, let me be one of the leaders of it. So when you have the basics of a network coming up, you have to have a way kind of agreed upon lexicon. You have to agree upon alphabet that you're going to speak. And so the first alphabet that came up with ASCII. And if you see in the top right, here's the ASCII alphabet here. And the way you encode, one of the most important things is abstraction in this course. And encoding is one of examples of abstraction. And this is an abstraction of letters to numbers. And that's one of the really powerful big ideas that you can digitize anything. So here I am mapping bits 
two letters. You can make bits to sound, you can map, as you know for MP3 files, you can map bits to colors and index into some table. So ASCII, you know what ASCII stands for? This is an annoying thing, stop that. Ah, uh, okay. Anybody know what uh, ASCII stands for? A lot from Brian, MITAs. Yeah, try it, Samir. Love it, love it. American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Well done. I'll give him credit for the last one. That's pretty cool. So uh, is there a key word in there? What's, of all those five words, what's the most important? American. You see, it was very limited scope. We were very, um, uh, we didn't have scale. We didn't really think about scale back then. We said, well, there's only a number of bits. And certainly, let's only consider us. Let's only be uh, 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 American-centric. So let's have the only American alphabet. And not think about any other thing, like you know, all the other alpha characters and other alphabets. Let's not think about that. Let's make that an another problem. And that's what they did. So this was an American standard code for information interchange. They had basic letters and punctuation and numbers. Um, in, in 69, this is the big deal. So this is back to 63, they came up with the standard. In 69, DARPA deploys the first of the internet. And that's the picture. That's the sketch of the picture of the first internet. It's pretty cool. If you look at them, where are all the places? Well, UCLA, SRI, Stanford Research Institute, Utah, and UC Santa Barbara. Isn't that cool? That's the and they were connected like this. So get to Utah, everybody had to go through SRI. Kind of cool. That's the nodes. Off of hanging off of those are the machines that they had on each other, those things. And that is, that is the first internet. Pretty cool. Where, how has it grown today? I'll show you that in a slide or two. Um, to make it work, though, you had to invent more things. And what the next big invention that was kind of on this slide that's, that they'd consider in the f flavor, in the, in the origins of the internet, was the invention of this thing called TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, and IIP, which stands for Internet Protocol. And taken together, it's one of the most important inventions of the internet. By the way, all together they're called, they're now called the Internet Protocol Suite. There's a lot of things that are now part of the Internet Protocol Suite, but TCP and IP were from the first two most important. And the, most, the coolest part of that was this. You take some information, might be a movie, might be a text file, might be email, might be anything. You want to get it from A to B. Well, you have to break it up into packets. Break it up into pieces, those things are called packets. You send the packets out over the Internet. It dynamically routes it to be the best way. Each of those packets dynamically routes to be to go the best way to the to the to the input to the destination. Okay, some of those packets may get lost. They may get sent to a machine. The machine may die, or the connection may get has noisy, or that packet, that little piece. You know, it's kind of like what's it like? It's like the Matrix, or it's like have you ever seen Tron, where you kind of take physical matter and you divide it up into lots of pieces. So all those pieces have to get put together perfectly to make this message, this digital entity recreated on the other side, right? Otherwise, you're dropping frames, you're losing sound, the sound will go b -b 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 -b, be missing some sounds, it won't sound good. So you have to have everything recreated on the other side. IP says, you know, we're going to handle the sh shifting around of all this stuff, and IP might drop some packets. It might lose it. So that's not going to work. This whole thing wouldn't work if it weren't for TCP running on top of that. TCP guarantees to the person using it, it guarantees delivery. So from the point of view above it, you don't care. TCP guarantees it to you, done. It's like you talk to FedEx, FedEx says, I'll guarantee this package is getting the next day. You don't care how they do it. it just, it'll happen, right? By hook or by crook, by plane or by Pony Express, they'll get something there. TCP was that essence. TCP says, I will guarantee to get your data to the destination. Is that cool? And IP might drop something, but TCP would be smart enough to say, well, if you drop something, well, I'll send it again until it finally gets there. Isn't that kind of cool? So that abstraction that TP could guarantee to people using it was that you'll always get it there. That's a really important idea. Vint Cerf was one of the folks who were inventors, and the phrase people talk about the, the internet is, revolutions like this don't come on very often. This is a really powerful idea. And one of the other reasons they invented this, by the way, is they didn't want to be able to have one centralized place where if the bad guys happen to bomb or happen to damage, we'd lose connectivity. So the beautiful thing about the internet is that you can't actually take it down. Because it's so distributed that you could lose one whole site, a whole state could go away, and the internet will still work for all the other states. It's really cool. So that's kind of nice. So all the power could go out in one state. We could still, we could still send things. It'll send it around that state. It won't go through that state. It's kind of neat. 
Exponential growth, we talk about exponential growth over, over and over. Exponential growth on the internet uh, in terms of the number of sites and the number of machines available. Email, huge. Chain, once you have the internet, remember, you're riding on the shoulders of giants. Once you have the internet, once you have connectivity, email is the next big thing to have uh, conversation between two, two parties. Fundamentally changed the way people interact. In fact, today, it has fundamentally changed that. Uh, texting is now taking that over and, and changing it in a different way. We'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the earliest examples of email was MIT's uh, time-sharing system in 1965. So they were part of the originators of this. Um, there's a model called store and forward, meaning data comes into you, and you actually don't immediately send it. You actually store it, store, 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 as more emails coming in, and then you just forward it along when enough comes in or when a certain time hits you. You forward. It's called the store and forward model. So things come in, and I'm kind of a buffer. Messages come in, messages come in, and I'm going to hold them, hold them, hold them, hold them, hold them until the right time to forward them on to the next section. So that's kind of the idea. It's not just all the way through. Everything's working too much. You kind of hold it there, and then you send it as a bulk. Um, Push technology versus pull is a really important idea. You probably have seen this if you go to your iPhone and you go and ask for different settings. It'll ask you whether you want pull or push technology. Um, pull, from the user's point of view, pull means I have to go and grab it all the time. Push means it just bling, and it'll tell me without me asking for something. So that's a very different model. Pull means I have to go and get it and pull. Every time I want to get email, I have to go there and pull it out. A push technology means that I just sit passively and things get pushed to me. Like, beep, 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 beep. Oh, I got a message. Like a phone call is kind of a push. Something pushes to me. But if I check my machine, if I check my answering machine, that's a pull. I go to my machine, and I pull the messages off of that versus a push. Um, the pros and cons, the pros and cons are obvious. The pros of this are it solves the logistics. You don't have to then be instantaneous. Before email, you have to get the other person on the phone or get them in face to face. And that means you and they have to be at the same place at the same time. Email allows for this asynchronous communication, which is really cool. What's the cons of that are, well, if you get too many emails, if all of a sudden I gave you too many emails from CS10, you'd start to ignore CS10 emails. And then I send you a really important one saying the midterms changed, and you might be in the ignoring mode because I've buffeted you with too much email. And that's one of the problems. Email overflow is actually a real problem. And Google just recently re 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 released in their Gmail feature a starred thing where they actually use some AI to try to flag the messages that are important, the ones that you've replied to, and put them at the top because you just get too many emails. It's really very, a very relevant problem right now. So I pri pri thank you. Priority inbox, I've already signed up for it, and I love it. It's great. It's really great. I mean, it helps you deal with all and spam fil filters and you know, folders that are automatically done. That helps you with that email overflow. Uh, spam is also a huge problem here as well. Um, here's how this stuff works. So you've got this internet. And I'll even kind of maybe zoom in over here. Um, you have Alice and Bob. And Alice wants to send email to Bob. But Alice doesn't actually know in the internet, which is often drawn as a cloud, by the way, just in case you didn't see that, um, Alice composes a mail to Bob, and Bob lives at b.org, and Alice is at a.org. Okay? So what's the next step? You need to know where b.org is. If I actually I'm sending these bits to some machine, I have to know where that is. Who knows what that is? Something called DNS, or the domain name system. It tells me exactly where that is. It resolves the name to an actual IP address. Okay? Then I also need to know where the mail exchange server is, it's kind of the store and forward part, the thing where the message is going through, like the hub. Okay? The mail is then sent to that exchange place, right? The MX called mailexchange.b.org. And then Bob is going to read in a pull fashion mail from there. And so here's Bob over here reading from his mail exchange server. So there was a communication with the DNS to figure out where those machines are. The location of the mail exchange server is sent back to here. This is my sender, the guy doing the sending for me. And then, and where's my cursor? I lost my cursor. And then the message actually is sent to the mail exchange server from my SMTP, my sender, to the mail exchange server where it's stored and forwarded in the sense it's waiting there for Bob to then queue it and grab it from there when Bob's ready to. Okay, kind of cool. And again, I'm trying to include as many as, if you ever, if you want to know more about this, these slides are already online, I try to include a lot of relevant links. So if you say, I like that, but that was very too much too brief an explanation, here's where to go. Every top of the slide I'll have kind of where to go to get more stuff. So. Personal computer. You say, well, Dan, you already talked about the computer. Well, that computer is worth the size of rooms, accessible to only to universities and big companies. Personal computer means every person, in theory, can own a computer. Now, realistically, economically, not everybody in the world can own a computer, but for many people in the first world, this is when humans could, uh, people in the first world could own their own personal computer. The first big one was the Altair. Um, in 80, 80, Altair 8875. The early mass-produced computers, this is about probably when you were being born, I'm going to guess. 
Um, the Apples, the Commodores, and IBM eventually ran away with the market when it decided, you know, if I can make an argument that computers in business are important and having a computer in each business person's desk is an important thing, and IBM also said, we'll also let other people make those computers rather than just us. Those two decisions, going for business and allowing people to kind of clone, in some sense, the IBM machines, IBM owned the market and still owns the market until now. The PC market is still owned for the most part by, by, by the IBM scene, by the IBM history, historical. By the non-Apple folks, by the non-Linux folks, by the Apple folks, the hardware is almost all IBM based. Or originating from IBM, I'm sorry. Uh, microprocessor was the key to making that, making that work. Uh, affordability was the key. The prices, what's fascinating, the prices for computers uh, back then are roughly the same as the prices for computers now. A couple thousand dollars is what you basically bought a computer for back then, and that's what you. That's what, I mean, aside from the real low end, like the Commodores, which are real low end machines, um, the Commodore 64 was a lower end, very, very much more affordable. The PET was a little bit higher end than that. Uh, here's here's the PET that was a lot more expensive, but the 64 was a low end version. Um, a couple thousand dollars is what you buy a computer for, and that hasn't changed over time. You get this massive thing that's millions of times faster and millions of times more space, but that same amount of money is kind of still what they talk about. Now, there is a push to make them more affordable. There is the idea of netbooks to make that, to bring it down to the $500 level, which is great. Um, and, I, and I applaud that, that decision because that's really what some people need. That's wonderful. In fact, you know, that's now what the iPad is coming into that space in terms of the $500 computer that you can have and make it very usable. That's exciting. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, laptops came in. This is really annoying. I need to do something about this. Uh, laptops came in, uh, and that allowed for portability. The first laptops were actually called luggables because they were much too heavy. They were basically a computer that they kind of shrunk, but it was still very heavy uh, compared to today's laptops, and including today's iPads that are just a couple of ounces almost. Um, they created entire industries. We all, you certainly should know about this being at Berkeley. Silicon Valley was the home of this, and that's really exciting for us. And the wealth that was created, the industries, I mean, incredible transformations to the economy. One person could be worth 50 billion. It's just an amazing amount. Imagine how much Microsoft has contributed to the economy of the United States. Think about that. It's really incredible. So great job, folks who have put that together. And again, they stand on the shoulders of giants before them who invented things and, and added to the, the wonderfulness of what a computer is. Many of you might, if I had asked you for your top 10 list, you probably would have added all the things that I've said so far. You may not have added this. This is a really important feature of the usability of computing called the WYSIWYG interface. WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get. And the idea is transformational and fundamental. Before WYSIWYG, you dealt with text-based input. And it was either terminal-based, where you had a paper, and you had a little, just maybe a one-line screen, or you had a little black and white monitor, and you had, were typing on this thing, and that's what you saw. When WYSIWYG came around, you had such a wonderful idea that you could use pictures and, and icons and, and graphics to semantically mean things in the computer and to be able to have, uh, it, it, it came along, by the way, this came along with the advent of the raster display. I don't think I listed that. But the raster display was one of the reasons this was able to be, to be, to be available. Uh, Raster meant that you could have you know, a grid of pixels, and you could address the pixels. And then when that became affordable, you had WYSIWYG becoming a reality. So WIMP stands for Window Icon Mouse or Menu and Pointer. And the WIMP style interface we still have today. The first fundamental change to this interface has really been the iPhone and the iPad. That's the first fundamental change to a Window Icon Mouse Pointer interface. It's very different, right? It's a touch screen display. And that's the first transformational difference in terms of usability of computing since 73. Nothing really has changed. Oh, now they have three button mice or two button mice. They have touch screens. But really, that interface that the, that the Apple folks have put together and other folks have put together as well in terms of touch, touch interfaces um, is the first big transformational advance since WIMP. Here's an example, what, here's an example of a picture uh, of an editor, a WYSIWYG editor. If you've ever used Microsoft Word, you're familiar with the WYSIWYG editor, although I think, I believe you can actually still go into Word and, and operate in non-WYSIWYG mode, where you're just typing things in the font. Actually, doesn't show the original font that you, that you work in. Um, I think it's called outline mode or something. Um, here's an example of writing code in LaTeX, which is not a WYSIWYG interface. You're writing, you're, you're writing a paper on the right and on the left, and you're telling it commands like section headings, like figure titles, and it might do auto numbering for you. And what you get on the left is this beautiful WYSIWYG picture, which when you print is exactly what you see. What you see is what you get means what you see on the screen is what you get when you print. That's what WYSIWYG means. Okay? And some editors, some popular editors now still in computer science, 
don't have you operate in a WYSIWYG mode. You're still operating by programming the, word pro the kind of word processor for it. That's very popular in writing papers for technical journals. <coughs> The next big thing we're talking about printing and visualization is the laser printer and postscript. Really important. Again, I don't jump around necessarily conjugally. They're together on the same slide, even though they happen quite a bit distance in time. The laser printer and postscript were very two bit different things, but they contributed toward the same idea that you could have personal printing that looked as good as a professional printing shop. That was an amazing transformation in terms of the democratization of technology, allowing everybody to produce you know, a flyer that looked as good as it used to cost you hundreds of dollars when you went to a professional print shop. Gary Starkweather is the one person who was thought to be the inventor of the laser printer. Pretty exciting. Basically, he took a copier. He worked at Xerox. He took a copier and hacked it. In the wonderful engineering spirit that we all kind of share, he hacked a laser printer to talk to the computer. It's pretty cool. And what he got was a laser writer. You basically were scanning. Uh, you have this, a lot of you have fine laser toner, which is very fine dust. Um, the scanner kind of heats it up at certain points. It then fuses. It, it's, still, it's still hot, still hot. It fuses onto the paper, absorbs into the paper. And part of the technology is how, how small a dot per inch can you get. And it's very common to get 600, 1,200, even more than that dots per inch, which is incredible. Think of how, how small that is in terms of the, the ink. A lot of work in terms of the actual laser ink, the actual laser toner. That's the printer. The printer is basically you hacked a, you hacked a copier. Postscript fundamentally changed how that worked and founded Adobe. The, the inventor of PostScript was the founder of Adobe, and Adobe is this big company that now does you know, Photoshop and, and Illustrator and all the, all the there's a creative suite that they have and it's a lot of great stuff. The idea, which was a really cool idea, I want to make sure you know this, is PostScript is you send a command. The way you print something is not by saying, well, here's a line, here's a line, here's a line. In terms of the picture, you're actually sending commands to draw the line. The line doesn't get drawn until the last stage. So it turns out that, uh, okay, maybe I should go take a second, take a break and quit that. But uh, I can probably quit that quickly. Okay, take a second, turn to, your, turn to your friends and talk about what the most exciting invention and in technology is. And you have 30 seconds, go. Okay. All right, let's come back. Fixed. So. The idea, by the way, that's going to be fixed. That, that error you just saw there is going to be fixed. I'm having them add air bears to this room for all the requests we've had for that. Um, and that's supposed to come this month. So that, was a, this, this, that, that problem will, ever, will go away once air bears officially gets added to this room. Um, so if I want to send a picture of a circle, I'm not sending the actual dots of the circle. I'm sending it circle. This is the center. That's the radius. So that, that print job would have been like, 30 characters long. The file that just draws a really pretty circle on a laser printer is 30 characters long. It just says some header stuff, and it says circle, radius, center point. That's it. It's really cool. So here are some examples. Courier fine font. That loads in there, whatever the courier font is, it loads it in for whatever that table is. 20 scale font. The argument is in the front, and then the command is at the end. So 20, so you kind of push 20 on, then you say scale font of whatever 20 was. So you're scaling the font by 20. Then you set that font. Then you say 72, 500, move to. So you're saying, here's the arguments to move to, which is 72, 500. Then you move to that place. Hello world, which is in parens, you say show. And they say show page. And that actually will show hello world on the, wall, on the screen. That actually works. If you take that copy from my slide, put it into a text file, rename it as .ps, double click it, and it will produce this cool thing. Is that neat? So that is the idea of PostScript, is that it's a series of commands, which is beautiful. It, and it's so powerful. Guess what? Turing complete. You know what that is. That means you can, in theory, it's just as powerful as every other language. And you could build another language. You could, in theory, build Scratch on top of PostScript in a crazy, wonderful way. Right? It's Turing complete. You can build anything on anything. They're all like, equivalently powerful. Um, the process of rasterizing is a new word. I try to underline new words. The process of rasterizing, meaning taking commands and actually making them pixels or the actual dots on the paper, is done by the printer or whoever's going to do it. So that's the cool thing is if the printer's only 300 by 300, 300 DPI, you'll get a circle that has a nice, you know, some, some small edges if you zoom in, but 300 DPI circle. If I happen to print it on a Linotronic scanner, 2700 DPI, I'll get this gorgeous smooth circle that looks perfect. 
So whatever the resolution of their device is, it'll say, when I draw my circle, I'm going to rasterize it to that resolution. Isn't that great? So we rasterize to my display, to my screen, 72 DPI, then I'll have a much more jaggy circle, but it'll still look fine for my display. It's kind of cool. Professional quality, output in the hands of people, that's one of the most significant things there. The spreadsheet, again, and I jump around in time here, um, critical for an industry. At the time, uh, in the 80s, when Lotus 1, 2, 3 was taking over business, this fundamentally changed business. The idea that you could, I mean, you, might, you may not use the spreadsheet much in your lives now, but it really did change business in terms of the finance world, at least. Um, the basic idea, as you know, you have, a row of, you have a row and columns of cells, and you can have expressions that relate one cell to the other. Really powerful idea. Stimulates a paper worksheet. There was a paper in 61 by Richard Math. Uh, Matisich, uh, that described the idea, but it really didn't take off until the 80s. And Lotus 123 was the first big one. And obviously, Microsoft Excel and uh, Apple's numbers. And there's quite a few. Open Office also has a, an equivalent thing. A lot of people have equivalent Excels. Google Docs now has a spreadsheet. And you can share access to that. In fact, there are even animations where Many people online go edit the same spreadsheet and they paint a picture. By color, coloring the cells, you actually make a picture that like, hundreds of people contribute to this gorgeous picture of a flower or something. It's a really, you should watch it on YouTube. It's a fun thing. Um, all by sharing a, a spreadsheet on, on Google Docs. Pretty cool stuff. So very viable, important piece in the business world. Audio and video conferencing, also critical for people who have remote sites. Uh, for example, DreamWorks Animation. Um, has two sites, one in Glendale and one in Redwood City. And they, they're both making animations. And you might have a talent, which is an animator or a renderer or a technical person, at one site. And they need to contribute their, you know, their, their critique to a piece of work on the other site. And before this, you have to ship that person over. Okay? With video conferencing, you now have amazing telepresence, where you might have this gorgeous High resolution, ultra high resolution display, and I'm sitting there, and I can see everything. I can almost smell the room, and it's basically like a wall. It's it's like a virtual wall that separates you from the other person, and now that wall is now glass, and now you can see through, and it's as if you're in the same room. Really cool. Um, how many of you have done video conferencing with your family or with a friends? Everybody. It's universal. It's amazing. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question later, which is. What's the most important technology that you use? I really want to see what you say. That's, that's the most exciting clinical question for today. So save that. Start thinking about that now. Um, the basics are, you know, we had closer closed circuit TV in the, in the 30s. There's what's called the mother of all demos. And this is Doug Engelbart giving the mother of all demos in 1968, in which he shows off the first use of a mouse, this amazing video conferencing system, uh, graphical input, uh, graphical interface. They were doing such crazy, wonderful work at Xerox Park, and he was there. Uh, giving what they call the mother of all demos. And you can actually just search for that phrase. And S I'm sorry, it's SRI. I'm sorry, SRI. Uh, you can search for that phrase and uh, watch this mother of all demos. And you'll be like, oh my gosh, all of these things in one video? It's incredible. Just very much like, um, like Sketchpad had all of these ideas in that one demo, the same idea that all these ideas are in this one wonderful demo. Uh, the impact is critical. Telemedicine is really exciting, where you can have a surgeon go around and just do virtual conferences with all the patients, and so they don't have to kind of schlep. they have the wasted time for traveling and all that. Educational impact is also really huge. There are a lot of courses that involve, in fact, Berkeley is engaged with an, a, a, a new master's program to make integrated, to be able to get an, a master's of science in integrated circuits in a, with video conferencing being a, a, a big part of that. So people will be all across the world taking our course, and there'll be a TA or a professor with a big screen and a high resolution camera answering questions and dealing with that with his remote students. So it's happening, it's coming here, folks. And there's a big push at Berkeley to actually have some more of that for online classes. We'll see where that goes, but that's a really big deal. So the web, uh, I'm sure you know about that, but you may not know the history of it. Um, the, the web started in 45. If I actually had given you a click of questions, what, what was the web kind of first invented, quote unquote, you'd say, oh, 70s, 80s, 2000. 45, um, Vannevar Bush, one of the, an MIT person, had a paper called Memex. It was an idea of hypertext, and the idea that you would link a document to another document and be able to jump from wherever I am, you know the web, but you'd be able to jump from some idea in the document to the other place, and now you'd be there. 
uh, and now I'd be there. And if that, if that had some idea, that you could just jump to some other thing. And you could basically connect everything in this wonderful web of things. Memek was a system. He described it in 45. Pretty cool. Tim Berners-Lee, 45 years later, gets a system up. And very quickly has this amazing exponential growth of the interest in his system in 90. That's the first web server in 1990. Remember, the internet has been around for a long time. But you ask, well, like, well, Dan, how did they, didn't they have email? Yeah, they had email. Didn't they have file transfer? They had file transfer. Didn't they have you know, document sharing? They had document sharing, but nothing like the web. The system became usable, really, in the, in the global sense, when Tim Berners-Lee Tim Berners came up with, who's, who's now, sorry, Sir, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, he's now been, he's been knighted uh, for, for that work. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, so he, the first web server, and that's his, that's his next cube, which is the first web server ever in 1990. Pretty cool. In 2000, I'm sure you know the dot-com, all based on the web, exploded, fortunes made, fortunes lost, all of that, bubble burst with that. This is called archive.org, the Wayback Machine, which actually tries to take a snapshot of the web. Okay? And you can go to there, and you can look at apple.com, or some random site that you like, and you say, show me apple.com back in 19... I don't know, whatever they started recording that. What do they have? 1994, 1993, 1995. And you'll see the first logo. They'll say, oh, web page that says, the new Apple, what do they call it? iMac, and it's big blue. And remember the old iMac? thing? You'll see like the web page that was the front page of Apple back in, it's really fun. It's like a time warpy thing. It's wonderful. Uh, it's also great if you've lost some files. I, I have, I've had people actually go back and get files that they've actually lost, deleted accidentally in their servers because the Wayback Machine stored it for them. So it's pretty cool. But I wouldn't. <coughs> That said, I wouldn't rely on that to save your <coughs> data. OK. Uh, uh, today, access anywhere. I mean, I can, I'm can. i sitting in in the, the forest of Puerto Rico, and I'm tapping away, and I'm getting the internet on my phone. It's just the, the, the confluence of all these wonderful technologies is, is remarkable. So great stuff that you can access it anywhere. Um, that's nice that you have all these people putting your data up and putting pages up and putting data out there and images. But unless you have a way to find it, not so useful, right? So enter web searching and the browser. That's 93. So even though the web came in 90, you didn't actually have web search in the browser until 93. The browser really was credited to Mark Andreessen, um, who was one of the first authors. I mean, there might have been other smaller ones, but it was the first big one. Um, at, at, at uh, I believe, at NCSA and NCSA U of I, University of Illinois. So he eventually became the founder of Netscape. Um, had the first web browser. And there was, a, there was a little icon for one of the first web browsers you have. Um, in terms of web browsers, there's a way to, uh, when you visit a site, it remembers what browser you're using to visit that site. The site actually knows that. There's some information passed on when you ask, request a site. And so now you can ask what the query is, a percentage of browsers that are out actually in the whole world. And they say IE, Internet Explorer now has 68% 60, of the market and Firefox 22. But those numbers are changing every year, and IE is losing share over time to what we've seen in Firefox and Opera and some other ones. Chrome, I think, is a new one kind of coming up. Um, search. So you have these browsers, but you need also to have some way to search it and then reflect what the search query is and kind of reflect how to get to stuff. And you all, I'm getting to the place where you know all this stuff. Um, but you, before this, you had a list of all the servers. You actually had a list of the servers that you could visit the server, and now there's some data there. Or so that server, data there. But you have to be able to, the, the ability to be able to say, here's a, quer a search query term, and here's, the, here's where they are, is a really powerful idea. You need a lot of, a lot of hardware to make that happen. You've got to have a machine that's kind of searching around and doing a lot of the work to do that, and you need a lot of data storage space to remember all that stuff. Um, so the 93 was the first search engine, and in 97 comes Google. There were other search engines before that. There was Yahoo. There was Ink to Me. There's other ones. Some people made a lot of fortune at Berkeley doing that. But the biggest one now, by far, is Google, um, which has this wonderful new system in which they rank pages based on if you're linked to another kind of highly ranked page. So you get highly ranked if someone, it's like a vouch system. If, if, it's, if a big site that has lots of links to that, if that links away to you, then that means that this big kind of central hub node thinks that you're a good site also. And so your ranking will go up based on the fact that you're linked to by this really highly ranked page. So that's called page rank. Each of, of the two founders of Google are worth, worth the last estimate, 12B. I say not just M, B, billion dollars. So this is a big deal. They had a wonderful idea of using ads uh, that, that was really that's painless for the user, right? It's just a little ad column. You, know, you can ignore if you want to. But that's funded, uh, the, funded all of that. And in theory, by the way, they have 
They didn't have, Google was also unique in that the early versions of it did not have paid. You couldn't pay. You, uh, other companies have actually had systems where you had to, if you want to be, when you type for used cars, you, if your thing comes up first, if your site comes up first, you'll have to get more traffic, right? Location, location, location. So those other sites, those other um, search uh, sites were, were actually having kind of an auction where if you paid the most money, your thing will come up first. Google didn't do that. Google said, we're just going to rank them on purely the basis of this page rank algorithm, which is updated constantly. One of the things that's really critical for Google is that People try, it, the, where you position is important to your business, right? If you type massage therapist Berkeley, if you're first, you're going to get more business. So that's really important for you to always show up near the top. So the summary is you, have to, you can game the system. If I, know what the, if I know what the algorithm is, I can game it so that I'll have, I can make fake pages or something to link to myself so I'll bubble my way up. Well, they know that and they adjust it always. It's like, a, it's like this constant game of the people who are, they set the new rules, and then people try to game and try to move towards so that they move up. And then they set the rules again. They have to keep moving as a moving target. Otherwise, people just, if they freeze it, people just game to that and obviously do some weird thing. And you can do a lot of kind of hacky things to make your stuff artificially move up, and that's unfair. So they have to continue to kind of actively not allow you to game it in that way. So enter probably what you are doing with your time, which is Web 2.0. Um, it hit really big in uh, 2004, 5, and 6. 2006, it was voted the person of the year. You, you were voted the person of the year because of Web 2.0. It's pretty exciting. Um, this this uh, tag cloud on the right is a picture of kind of all the ideas that are in Web 2.0, like you know, usability, participation, convergence, video remixability. All these ideas are still part of Web 2.0. The idea is that. You are contributing to the content, not just you passively watching content by somebody else, which was kind of the pre the Web 1.0 model. Web 2.0 is you are contributing to the value of a site. And you all know this. I'm telling you things you know already, but that's the big idea. It's pretty cool. Take back the web. You know, take back the night, take back the web. It's pretty exciting. Web mapping is a really awesome thing. Web mapping is so cool. Um, the idea that you have Satellite imagery, it's also a privacy issue, right? We, we kind of, that's one of the things you re probably read about in, 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 uh, in the book recently. Uh, you've got this wonderful idea that you're combining satellite imagery. You you're, you're also have maps of roads, and you're connecting them together. So you can not only have a real, um, a very accurate picture of what the road is and what's at the side of each road, but also the street view is this wonderful idea that you can click down. And other people have tried to do other, other versions of that. But I can, you can show me. I've done this in the past where I've gonna see, I'm going to go to some meet, I found an intersection I, I've never been to before. And I'll go to Street View and I'll say, oh, it's right where I'm going to meet them is right next to the Noah's Bagels. And so I'll know when I'm driving my car, look for Noah's Bagels. It's amazing that I wouldn't necessarily know that. And I'll even know what the facade looks like. Oh, it's a big purple one with the green and a big sign saying sale. I'll know that thanks to Street View and thanks to some of the stuff they've done. So I love web mapping. It's just really great. What's cool is, Collaborative maps are really exciting. So there's a thing called Wikimapia, where the community itself, can, in a Web 2.0 way, can contribute to what the map is. And you can say, well, you know, this is a neighborhood. This is San Francisco, but this is my neighborhood. And that's what it's called. That's what's Visitation Valley or something like that. That's kind of cool stuff. So layered content is also really powerful, where you can layer lots of things on top of that. You can layer where all the high schools are in the United States. Or I can layer where the crime is best or worst. You can layer all these things on top of that. And it's just really wonderful to be able to put the, connect it all together. Almost done. We're doing pretty well with this. Software as a service uh, is a big new deal. It's what the, it's called SaaS. And it's one of the big ideas um, that's coming through in the last couple of years that you have not, not just Google Docs, where you have, and I've mentioned several times before, where not just the idea that you have a shared document, you're all working on it together in different flavors. This could be Photoshop or other things. But that the cloud, the cloud is able to handle your computing issues. So you can have a supercomputer in the cloud, and I need some, I need some huge computation run. Well, I just use the cloud, borrow the cloud, do some stuff, and come back, and there's my answer. In a way that I can just seamlessly ask for it and get resources and drop and give them back, so that it's all shared. But I don't need them all at the same time. In the olden days, I have to buy that whole compute cluster. Now I can just buy time on a shared compute cluster. Powerful, powerful idea. Software as a service is a really big idea. Mobile phone certainly has transformed the world. Um, the earliest version is a wireless cell phone, 1908. It's pretty incredible how early that was. Think about that. That's really quite incredible. Um, in uh, 1983, the first FCC-approved phone is here. I have a picture of that. 
You might remember there's some 80s movies where they want to show a really rich person like Gordon Gekko, and he's got this big, huge phone. Because that's like only the rich people had the early phones. And, you know, they were really big and they're heavy. And that was like, oh, I had this. I'm holding up. I got you. I got you. And that was the big, that was the big phone back in the days. Um, the first PDA. PDA is a personal digital assistant. And that, they had PDAs that weren't connected to phones for a while. I don't know if you remember that, but Palm and some other folks were at the PADA market, and now they're all just merged. It's obvious that you have one device that you carry that has both your PDA stuff, your digital assistant, your calendar, and the phone itself. And that's the merge, and that's the smartphone, and that's really excited. exciting. Texting is this new deal. I think texting is taking over the world. Uh, they've measured the number of text messages, which is now in the billions of text messages created annually. It's really exciting. It's affected language. People are now. It's affected their language. People are, start, are submitting, high school students in college are submitting essays that actually have the text equivalent of the word because they don't remember what the real word is and what the text word is. So they're actually, write, they're actually writing GR8 and submitting the paper to a professor with the word GR8 as a word that they think is a word. So it's crazy that, you know, that if, that's, if that's actually how you're communicating all day is texting, you'll forget what real English was and what text English is. It's really quite fascinating in that way. You can see the exponential growth of the texting <laughs> phone use. Here we go. Survey. A couple minutes left. I'm doing great. I'm on time. What is the most important technology in your life? So one by one, I'm going to steal these things from you. I'm going to take away video conferencing. I'm going to take away Facebook. I'll take away this. What's the last thing they pry from your cold, dead hands? Does that make sense? What's the most important thing that you have in your life of this list. I try to kind of get up with the top five, OK? Here we go. No right answer. Go. I'm going to be really fascinated by this result. And while we're voting, TAs, are we, are we announcing about the, the a shifted delivery date for the presentation thing? Or is that official yet? Yeah, it's, official. it's official. OK, it's official. I surveyed some people. They said they didn't know about it. So remind them now, just again. OK, we're having project night. Do you want to announce the project? You want to write on the board quick if you have the time? I think we got it. We got a time, right? Do it quick. That will be tomorrow night. Project night is going to be when John and I are sitting in the WAS, John? Yeah. OK, Luke and John are going to be in the WAS in project night. We, we, this is all the initiation of these awesome TAs. They came up with the idea. Give them credit for this. Project night, go Bears, Tuesday, 8 PM to 10 PM. It's late. It's, it's, it's when, they, when they couldn't get the room any other time. It's not, is it required or not required? It's not required. Not required, but if you want it. It's to help you with your projects, I think, basically, right? Tomorrow? Yeah. Tomorrow. OK, let's come back. Ready? Stop. Talk to your neighbors for 30 seconds. What, what you said. Go. What did you say? Um, Twitter. Twitter. I'm leaving, I'm leaving the country on Friday. I'm not coming back until summer. Okay. So thank you very much. Oh. I'll follow it through the web. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, we have it online. That's great. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm back in the fall and instead have maybe I'll do the second half. That's fine. Wonderful. Good thank having you, you here. No, my I pleasure. My, my pleasure. Wonderful. All right. Take care. Thank good. Very good. All right. Let's come back and vote. You and your partner have to vote together as the together. Come on. If they were different, you got to like talk. Come on. Who's? Come on. You are consensus. All right, come back and stop. OK. Wow, look at you. That's incredible. That's incredible. This is the, well, here's question two. Let's go question two. And then, so this is individually, and this is question three. That is incredible. Wow. Cell phone, web search, email. Zero video conferencing, zero. Facebook, I could not, I would not. Boy, I would have lost that money on that bet. That, you would have listed that. Wow. And the right answer is cell phone. OK, so <laughs> in summary. How many of the 21st century, the next big things are happening right now? Here, I'll just read this quick list. Natural language processing, having a computer understand English or some language. 3D displays, robotics, self-driving cars. Google just announced a self-driving car. Crazy stuff. Optical or quantum computing. 
personal air vehicle. Jump. I'm late for class. I'm late for class. Space travel. They are starting to have space travel now for, for people who are really rich. Uh, computer display in the glasses you always have with you. Computer, computer flexible displays on my body. Brain machine interfaces. The matrix. And energy. Energy is really big. Thinking about the next big energy breakthrough. We'll see you on Wednesday when we have a guest from Twitter. Woo!